You know, I, I just want to mention uh, something that uh, Dr. Koch was mentioning about uh, the uh, natural proclivity of humanity to believe in God. Uh, there was a philosopher, I wish I could remember his name at the moment, but he said that if God did not exist, it would be necessary for humanity to invent him or to create him. And because we do need him and we are made with a natural uh, need to connect with something much bigger, something much higher. And of course we know that one to whom we connect, that one as it says in Ecclesiastes, he has put eternity in their hearts. That is the one who became our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to be in the uh, book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, one of the what's called post-exilic books, that is, that after the exile of Israel there in Babylon, here the prophet Ezekiel, and we're going to be primarily in Ezekiel 43, uh, the prophet Ezekiel, or at least that's where we're going to begin, the prophet Ezekiel, in vision, he sees the very temple of God. And we see this, these visions beginning in about the 40th chapter. And his book, that is Ezekiel here in these chapters, described the layout, the design of what has been called by some scholars as the Millennium Temple. It is believed by some that just prior to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ that the Jewish people will construct the temple there on the historic site of Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem. And it is in the minds of some to this temple that our Lord Jesus Christ will come. And that when he returns and when he enters that temple, he will fill it with glory. Now there may be some credible credibility to that view. But it is not the only view of this vision of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 40 to 46 describes the layout of the temple complex, some of the courts, and the uses of the various chambers that surround the temple, some of the sacerdotal folk functions of the priests, and some of the furnishings of the temple. It also describes what is called the holy district, an area surrounding the temple, and even what is described as the prince of the feast. Now, the reason for this tour of the temple, we see found in Ezekiel 43, verses 10 to 12. When we read, you, son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, show the house to the house of Israel, that is, show the temple to the house of Israel, that they might be ashamed of their iniquities. And let them measure the pattern. And if they be ashamed of all that they have done, show them from the house and the fashion of it and the goings out and the comings in and all the forms of it and all the ordinances and all the forms and all the laws that are written there in their sight, that they may keep the whole form of it and all the ordinances and do them. This is the law of a house on the top of the mountain and the whole area round about it. You will call it most holy. Behold, this is the law of the house. So the reason to show the people of Israel this vision, this vision, this prophetic view of the temple and this tour that the angel or the man takes Ezekiel on is so that the people of Israel come to repentance. Again, the temple represented a perfect right relationship with God. So through the prophet Ezekiel, the people of Israel are given the proper use of the temple. To see the ideal form of that temple, the way it was meant to be. That is, how Israel's relationship with the great God had always been intended to be. And they're told through Ezekiel that if they see these things, and if they come to repent, then even more will be shown to them. That there are greater things beyond what are they are being shown in the vision. What does all this say to the prophet? Again, those who prophesied to the people of Israel understood their relationship in terms of the temple. They understood that relation through the view of the temple. A glorified temple spoke of Israel's relationship with God as being everything it was meant to be. In Ezekiel chapter 47, verses 1 to 2, Ezekiel is shown as he stands in the door of the very temple, a flow of water that issues forth from it, from the very south side of the altar, going forth into the land 
and to the various bodies of water and brings healing. Ezekiel writes, Afterwards he brought me again to the door of the house, and behold, the waters issued forth from under the threshold of the house and eastward. For the forefront of the house stood towards the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house, at the south side of the altar. Then he brought me out of the way of the north gate, and he led me down the way to the utter gate by the way that looks eastward. And behold, there ran out water in my sight. Now this water flows through and out to the world, but it happens after what we read in Ezekiel 43, verses 1 to 5. You see, this is what brings about all that we see after all the tour of the temple, all those things that were to take place there, the measuring of all those things in the water flow, all these things occur after what we see in Ezekiel 43, beginning in verse 1. Ezekiel wrote, Afterwards he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looks to the east, and behold, the glory of the Lord came from the east, and his voice was like the noise of many waters, and the earth shined with his glory. And it was according to the appearance of the vision which I saw, even according to the vision that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the visions that I saw by the river Chebar, and I fell on my face. And the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is towards the east. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. After all the glory of the Lord has re-entered the temple, then he sees the way things were always meant to be. It is after the glory of the Lord fills the temple that he sees the way things were always meant to be, and the water flows goes forth and brings healing to the land. In Ezekiel 47, verse 3, it says, And when the man that had the measuring stick in his hand went forth eastward, he measured the cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to my ankle. And again he measured a thousand, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. And he measured a thousand, and he brought me through, and the waters were to the loins. And afterwards he measured a thousand, and the water was a river that I could not pass it. And the waters were risen, and waters in which to swim, a river that could not be passed over. So the waters grow ever deeper as they flow from this now glorified temple. Waters that go forth to bring healing. Ezekiel's guide takes him back to the banks of this river that flows forth from the temple. And he takes him back to the very temple, to the sides of the water bank. Those waters that go forth in healing of the salt sea and bringing life to the dry ground. In verse 6, the latter part, he said, he, that is Ezekiel, he led me and brought me back to the river bank. And when I turned, behold, the bank of the river, there were many trees on one side and on the other. And he said to me, these waters issue towards the eastern district and go down into the plain and they go into the sea where they brought forth into the sea the waters of it and they were healed. And it will come to pass that every living thing which moves, whatever, whatever the water comes to, they shall live. And there will be a very great multitude of fish, for these waters will come there, and the waters of the sea will be healed. And everything will live wherever the waters go. And it will come to pass that fishermen will stand on the banks from En Gedi even to En Galen, will be a place to spread forth nets, and their fish will be according to their kinds. And the fish of the great sea will be exceedingly many. That is, that wherever the water goes, there is life. The waters are healed. The rivers are full of life, teeming with fish. The banks of the river are lined with trees that bear fruit. Is this vision of Ezekiel's temple 
as some again refer to it as the millennial temple, is it only for the future? What about for Christians? What about for you and I, those who believe now? How can we see something greater in Ezekiel's vision? Is this just a prophetic occurrence for people yet to be born? But what about for us today? When we read the scriptures through who Jesus is, and not just through the view of events, we see that Ezekiel's temple speaks to us today. It speaks to us regarding the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, understand that the temple represented to the prophets Israel's ideal relationship with God. That relationship as it was always intended to be. But what about for you and I? What about for us today? What does it say to you and I? When we view the Word of God through who Jesus is, it allows us to see deeper things. The greater intent. When we look through the Scriptures, not dividing it into past or the future, but seeing it through who Jesus is, we see in the pages of Scripture Jesus Christ standing forth as the very central theme of all the Bible, including the vision of Ezekiel's temple. John 5, verse 39 to 40, it says, You, speaking to the Pharisees, you study the Scriptures diligently because you think that by studying them you will have eternal life. These Scriptures are the very Scriptures that testify about me. That is, all the Scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, speak to us about the person of Jesus. They testify about who He is. In Luke 24, verses 25 to 27,